In this two-part video, we'll learn how to write user-defined functions in MATLAB. The last video explained the purpose and syntax of functions. This video dives into MATLAB to practice calling a function. More specifically, we're going to be using the get underscore geometry function from the last video. Before we do any coding, I'd like to illustrate a few changes I made in the get underscore geometry function. First, I added an fprintf statement to confirm the user's inputs. I also added another fprintf statement to print the rectangle's perimeter. Recall that the fprintf statement for the area variable already existed in the PowerPoint from the last video. You can download this function from the link in the video description. Make sure this function is saved as a standalone.m file in your working directory or wherever you want to save it. The file must be named get underscore geometry dot m. If you change either the file name or the function name, you'll get a warning and MATLAB will be unable to run the function. Since we have the function, let's create a driver script to call it. I've provided the template of the driver script we'll use in the video description. In the driver script, we'll call the get underscore geometry function four times with various input arguments. For case one, let's just set some arbitrary length and width parameters to see what we get when we call the function. I like to copy and paste the main part of the function header to call the function. When we run the code, we get the three fprintf outputs as expected, and the variables perim and area appear in the workspace. This confirms we've correctly called the function. In case two, let's say we only want the area to be outputted from the function. If you recall from the last video, we can have MATLAB ignore an output by replacing it with a tilde in the function call. For this case, let's use different values of length and width as well. We can see that we now have the area variable, but not the perim variable in the workspace. One critical thing to remember when writing and calling functions is that the order in which you supply the input arguments matters. When a function is called, the values of the input arguments are passed into the function, and the values are stored in the function's parameters. Therefore, accidentally flipping the order of the input arguments means you're giving a parameter an incorrect value. Here's an example to illustrate this. Instead of giving the length argument and then the width argument, we flipped it in the function call. That means the value stored in width actually corresponds to what the function thinks is the length. Similarly, the value stored in the length variable, 1, is considered to be the value of the width within the function. This is evident in the first fprintf line, which obviously differs from the length and width values we assigned before invoking the function. This fprintf line illustrates the importance of building in checks like this to your functions. If we didn't have this fprintf line, we wouldn't necessarily know we accidentally flipped the order of width and length here. The numerical values of perim and area are correct, but that's only because the calculations in this specific example don't explicitly depend on the order in which you supply the inputs. Now let's do the final example. So far, we've used the variables length and width as inputs to the function and called the outputs perim and area. These are consistent with the function header, but we don't always have to conform to this. Length, width, perim, and area are all just variables after all, so we can basically call them whatever we want. The function works as expected. The values of the length of rectangle and width of rectangle variables hold the values 1 and 5 respectively, which are then sent into the function. From there, the function uses the values 1 and 5 to compute the perimeter and area. The values of the perimeter and area are stored in variables named perimeter of rectangle and area of rectangle instead of perim and area. 
Once again, this works because the input and output arguments are just variable names, so we can freely change them. This is helpful if you need to call a function multiple times. For instance, I might have one pair of length and width values corresponding to one pair of perimeter and area values, but I might want to redo the calculation with another pair of length and width values. In this case, the function will work perfectly for both. This concludes the two video sequence on MATLAB functions. I hope you learned how to write and call functions. Functions are incredibly useful and we'll be writing plenty of functions for the remainder of the course. See you next time.